The Lord be with you. Gathered together this morning, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent, also daylight savings time. Hopefully, uh, you all were able to make it here safely with the weather and the time change. But uh, glad to be able to lead you in worship here this morning, this Sunday in Lent. Glad to have the choir offering a choir anthem for us as well. Our order of service, divine service setting four, found on page 203 in the Lutheran service book. We begin with our opening hymn, a familiar hymn, By Grace, I'm Saved.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness. Let us confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. And together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son Jesus Christ to die for you. For his sake, he forgives you all of your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an enemy encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trial. Seal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be. It's my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness give thanks for all your benefits and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent is from Numbers chapter 21. 
From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that they take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the serpent, the bronze serpent, and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we greet the Holy Gospel with the Lenten verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. To you, O Lord. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
seated for the hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. The word of our Lord that serves as a foundation for our sermon is our Old Testament reading, especially verse 9. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Please be seated. It's called a caduceus. Caduceus, it's the image used by first responders in almost every city in America. Little seek and find here. You find the image in your bulletin. There in the inside of your bulletin, the bottom right corner. You'll often see this image, the side of emergency vehicles. I know it's familiar to probably just about everyone here. You see it maybe on the side of emergency vehicles or even inside elevators and perhaps on medical jewelry around people's wrists. You may observe several variations of the caduceus, and you may be thinking that as you're looking at this one. Say, hey, I've seen it in a different form here. But more often than not, the caduceus can be confused with the so-called rod of Asclepius, not to get too far into the weeds of Greek mythology here. But the rod of Asclepius, the Greek god of healing and medicine who wielded a serpentine rod. Regardless, though, one thing is for certain. When we see an image like this, we know that help is on the way. 
The ubiquitous symbol in our culture, in the world around us, tells everyone who sees it that the rescue they need is right where they are going to be. It comes to them. Well, from the beginning of the wilderness wandering, the book from Exodus to Numbers records the constant complaining by the Israelites against Moses and Aaron in an at least It at least signals this one thing, that they are in dire need of help even when they do not realize it themselves. This is their situation, the constant complaining of the Israelites against Moses and against Aaron. The people did not like the bitter water of Merah, as we read in the book of Exodus, after they were delivered from Egypt and after they crossed the Red Sea. They didn't like the water that was struck from the rock that Moses struck and the rock that provided, that God provided for them. So the Lord showed Moses how to sweeten the water. The Lord kind of condescending to their complaining a little bit. And then they grumbled a bit later about the food. So the Lord gave them manna. They griped that they were thirsty. So Moses struck the rock at the Lord's command and water gushed forth. And when they left Sinai, they again asked for meat to eat, and a wind from the Lord brought quail for his people. But the birds were accompanied by a plague. Then in Numbers 14, after reaching the promised land for the first time, the people rebelled at the prospect of invading Canaan. Our Old Testament reading for today records this final complaint in a series. And that whole series that we just recounted there, that whole series of complaints, now in numbers here, our Old Testament reading for this morning records this final complaint of the people. It culminates the entire series because for the first time, the people spoke, it says, against. They spoke against God and against Moses. In case you're keeping score at home, that's not a good idea to speak against God and against his servant, his servant that he chose, his servant Moses, that represents his people. The people then became low. The people became despised in the sight of the Lord because they spoke against God and against Moses saying, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food, there is no water, and we loathe this worthless food, even calling the provision of the Lord worthless. We know from the scriptures that the people of Israel were prone to speaking and grumbling against the Lord and against Moses during their 40-year wandering in the wilderness. And in this particular instance, the people became impatient with the Lord because of how and where he was leading them. The Old Testament reading says from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Well, what's the big deal, you might be thinking? If you were to look at the map that displays Israel's wanderings in the wilderness, you would see that the people set out from Mount Hor and toward the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and they were actually heading away from, away from the promised land, the land that the Lord promised to them, heading away from it, not toward it. I can't imagine taking my kids on a trip and telling them where we're going to go, you know, and then leading in the opposite direction and traveling for hours. Can you imagine the impatience, the grumbling that might take place, especially if they were to realize that we are heading in the complete opposite direction? And so our Old Testament reading also says the people became impatient impatient on the way, maybe an understatement, and becoming impatient. They grumbled, they spoke against, against the Lord and against Moses. We also, when we become impatient with one another, even with the Lord, we also are prone to this kind of grumbling and speaking against the Lord, maybe against other people not content, not fully trusting, maybe doubting the Lord's provision for our lives and his will in our lives. 
wondering why particular situations might be happening in our own lives, in our nation, and prone to that grumbling, aren't we? Maybe even prone to grumbling and complaining against other people, the very people that the Lord has given to us and put in our lives. But what's particularly alarming in this instance in our Old Testament reading is that the Lord despises the people for it. The people become low. They become despised in the sight of the Lord because of their distrust, because of their lack of faith, because of their thanklessness, their outright blasphemy, speaking against God and against Moses. And so he judges their sin against them, gives them what they deserve in their sin, punishment and death. Of course, we read sending those fiery serpents that bite the people so that many of the people of Israel died. Could be a poisonous snake known to that area and the word fiery there could refer to the pain. Perhaps the pain that's inflicted by the serpent as some commentators believe. This, you could say, is what happens to the things and the people that become low, that become despised in the sight of the Lord in the Bible. It's not a pretty sight. But the Lord will also show mercy. Show mercy to a low and despised people. The Lord will lift them up. Lift them up to a right status in his presence. We see when the people confess their sin to Moses and own up to it, Moses intercedes. He intercedes in prayer to the Lord for them, and the Lord answers Moses' intercessory prayer. He answers with a plan, a plan that involves lifting up something low and despised in their place as a substitute. The serpent, the serpent that was the instrument of God's judgment upon them, could you get any lower and any more despised than this? We learn from the curse in the Garden of Eden that the serpent is cursed above all livestock and beasts of the field. And though the serpent was Satan's instrument of choice in the Garden of Eden to bring about the fall of mankind, here in the wilderness of Sinai, the Lord chooses this same low, this same despised serpent as an instrument to show not only a judgment, but more importantly, to show love, to show mercy to his people. That everyone, every one of his people at that time who's bitten, when they see this low and despised serpent lifted up on the pole according to the Lord's command, they will live. After all, God promised to show such love and mercy in the Garden of Eden when he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, he says in Genesis 3, and you shall bruise his heel. The first gospel, the first good news proclamation in the gospel or in the Bible God chooses what is low and he chooses what is despised in the world. God shows mercy to the whole world by taking what is low and despised and lifting it up. Well, like other complaint stories and complaint accounts in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, this one in Numbers, in the book of Numbers that we have in our Old Testament reading, This one continues to hold forth God's grace for salvation. Three times in the Gospel of John, Jesus himself refers to being lifted up, lifted up in the same way as the serpent in our Old Testament reading in Numbers 21. Jesus then interprets the action of the serpent being lifted up as fulfilled in his crucifixion fulfilled in his crucifixion for rebellious sinners like you and me who have been low and despised in the Lord's sight, poisoned by original sin since the fall. And here in the wilderness of our sinful rebellion, we see this crucified Christ, a caduceus of sorts, an image which draws our attention 
to the spiritual first responder of sin. Jesus, the one who was hung on a cursed tree for our sins, and by looking to him in faith, we receive healing, and we receive eternal life through our salvation that he bore for us on the cross and secured in his resurrection. And additionally, there are even more promises to all who look in faith upon this Jesus, this Jesus who hangs on a tree. First, we read, he will give them eternal life, and then he will give you the ability to recognize who he is, that he is the salvation of God, and that he is the light of life. And finally, by this action, he draws all people, all people to himself. We see these promises fulfilled most clearly at the moment when Jesus was lifted up, when he was crucified in the gospel of John. And there in that account of the crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus, he creates a community of forgiven people. He draws them together as a family, as he says to his mother, Behold your son, and to John, one of the disciples there at the foot of the cross, behold your mother, drawing all people to himself, a community of faith, drawn together in this Jesus who is lifted up, gathered around his life-saving work of atonement on the cross. The same community of faith that he creates here, the people of God at Emmanuel. And here, and the season of Lent. This image, this image of the caduceus fulfilled ultimately in Jesus becomes a powerful symbol which is transformed by our reading from Numbers and by the work of Jesus. Every time we see a caduceus out in the world, we now have a moment to pause. Perhaps we can pray for those that folks are trying to save, while also giving thanks, giving thanks to God for saving us through Jesus, who is lifted up for the salvation of the entire world. And when we see this image out in the world, it can suddenly be transformed into that moment to stop and consider God's working in the world through the life-saving efforts of others while also reminding us of that life-saving work of Jesus. It becomes a vision, a vision of God's work in the world. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue now with the prayer of the church. We pray for all people in Christ Jesus, for the church and the world. O oh Lord, draw us into your light. Expose wherever we, like your people of old, have thought, spoken, and acted against you, that in repentance we might look to your Son lifted up on the cross and be saved from your righteous wrath. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, you gave your only Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We pray that you would bless the work of missionaries as they carry this gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray for those that our congregation supports in various ways, for the Malbergs, the Neuendorfs, the Zabodis. We pray for their work that they, as they carry the gospel forth, that many may hear of your love in Christ Jesus and be saved through him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have set our president and our governor before us as authorities and put them over us for our good. 
Bless and sustain them, we pray, with all they need to govern us. We pray that you would lead them to repentance and faith where necessary, that they might rule wisely and in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you had Moses lift up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, thereby foreshadowing your own sons lifting up on the cross. Teach us to hear in the Old Testament the promises and pictures of the coming Christ, who is their Savior and ours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you are our our light and our salvation. Hide in your shelter those for whom we pray, for Rachel, Cecily, Annette, and Brian. We also pray for conflict in Gaza between Israel and Hamas. We pray for an end to that conflict according to your will for peace where you see fit for repentance and faith in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, whose steadfast love endures forever, we lift up our voices in thanksgiving. You have redeemed us out of trouble and gathered us here to feed us that our souls may may not faint within us. Satisfy the longing of our hearts within your son's good things, his body and his blood, that we may abide in your eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. For the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet in mercy, you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary, you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us like Abraham, our father, to trust in your mercy and your promise now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament to my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn.
Good morning. This coming Wednesday, we continue our series, our Lenten series, the Catechism in six parts, looking at the fifth chief part of the small catechism, and each service is preceded with the supper at 5.15. Uh, please consider joining us for that, as I know a number of you have throughout this Lenten season. Next, we're looking to next week. The, uh, of course, our divine service next Sunday, but uh, next weekend we have some different things going on. So there will be a concert on Sunday afternoon at Trinity. See the bulletin for more information on that. And then Saturday morning, we have our safety meeting here, Saturday, March 16th here at the church. Again, take a look at the bulletin for more information on that. Join us now for our education hour. We have coffee and conversation and Bible class, the adult Bible class downstairs. Uh, we'll be looking, continuing our tough topic series in accord with our strategic plan that the congregation approved a number of years ago, a couple years ago now. And so uh, we begin a series here looking at critical race theory and what the scriptures have to say about that following a Bible study that's put together by an LCMS pastor. The children can join for Sunday school and the youth for youth Bible study in the west side of the building. The Lord be with you. And 